Welcome to Season 6 of Purposeful Empathy, a show dedicated to amplifying the voices of people from across the globe who believe the world needs more empathy and are doing something about it. Today's episode is brought to you by Grand Huron International, an on-demand coaching provider for individuals and companies. Thanks for watching. Enjoy the show. Welcome to a new episode of Purposeful Empathy. Today, I'm joined by the fabulous Catherine Manning, who is president of Blackbird, a company that provides empathy, training, and coaching in the workplace. She has spent her career helping organizations support their clients and employees through challenging times, including 15 years at the U.S. Justice Department, where she advised on victim issues for highly publicized cases, including the Boston Marathon bombing, the Pulse nightclub shooting and the Bertie Madoff scandal. She is also the author of The Empathetic Workplace, Five Steps to a Compassionate, Calm and Confident Response to Trauma on the Job. It is a book that I have read and I love it. I'm so excited to unpack all of the stuff that you've written about. Welcome to the show, Catherine. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be here. So, yes, I'm excited. I'm excited to have this conversation. I'm going to start with this little quote that's at the very end of page nine that says, the fact is, if we work with people, we are working with people in trauma. Tell us a little bit about that to start. Absolutely. Um, I think it might help first. Let me tell you what I mean when I use the word trauma. I'm a lawyer. I'm not a psychologist. So this is not going to be a you know, psychological textbook definition. The definition of trauma that I use is a very practical one. And it's a psychological injury that affects your performance. So we are surrounded by people who are suffering because of things that have happened in their past, anything from childhood violence up to um, bankruptcy, divorce, addiction, domestic violence. Um, I spoke with one expert who said she estimates that 40 to 50% of the U.S. adult population is walking around with unaddressed trauma. I believe it. Yeah. Yeah, so there we are. We're wandering around our workplaces and half of us have a heavy load uh, and heavy burden on our on our hearts, minds and souls. Yeah. So why is empathy in the workplace so important? Well, um, one of the things that I find particularly amazing about the ways that we support each other through times of trauma is the incredible bonds of trust that it creates. Um You've probably heard the term and your listeners have heard the term psychological safety, which means um, it's a a term um, largely popularized by Amy Edmondson and her book, The Fearless Organization. And what it refers to is the sense that it I feel comfortable within this space to admit that I don't know the answer or that I made a mistake or that I'm having a hard time right now. Well, there's been a lot of research that shows that organizations where there is psychological safety far outperform other organizations in terms of productivity, creativity, higher communication, better ethical behavior, kind of across the board on every measure. Teams where there is a sense of trust and psychological safety are much more successful than teams where there's not. And The other thing we've learned is that the fastest way to build psychological safety is to support each other through hard times. Mm -hmm. So if I can know that I can go to a coworker and say, I'm really, I'm really struggling today because I'm having a hard time with my child um, and I'm going to need some help getting this project done. And that coworker listens and is supportive and is there for me. That is building a strong bond of trust between the two of us. And then similarly, I'm going to be there for that person, right, going forward. Um, I spoke with one CEO a little while ago, and he told me that there was a a guy in his organization, top, top leadership position, who had always been somebody they had relied on a lot. Um, And suddenly this man's performance just took a nosedive. He started showing up late for work, turning in projects late, not really paying attention in meetings. And they had no idea why he wasn't saying what was going on. And all of the other top leaders talked about it. And they, they said, I think we're going to have to fire him. 
because we can't have somebody in this position who's not able to carry the load. And finally, one of them said, well, let me just go talk to him and just see what he has to say for himself. Well, when they did that, they found out that his wife was dying. Hmm. He hadn't wanted to bring it up in the workplace because he thought maybe it wasn't appropriate to bring personal issues into work, but obviously it was affecting everything about his ability to perform at work. And once the rest of the team knew that, they were able to put supports in place for him and, and listen and you know support him psychologically as well. That man's performance, according to the CEO, did a 180. Just after this conversation, just his ability to open up about the hard thing that he was carrying and feel supported through it. Um, and so they were able to, you know, get him through this time. And just imagine the loyalty that this man now has to this company. I mean, you stood by me when my wife was dying. I mean, I will do anything, right, for this organization and these people. Um, that's the power of empathy, the way that we can... Um, build these bonds of trust, really, it's, it's astronomical in terms of um, our communication, our productivity, but also more importantly, our, our sense of safety, our, our mental health, our physical health in these places where we spend a big chunk of our lives. Yeah, and I think already like the business case for empathy at work was being made prior to COVID. I think COVID only really dramatized the degree to which we actually have to be recognized in our whole complex, colorful selves at work. We're humans first before we're any role. Do you feel like um, things will move in the direction that we need it to go? Do you think corporate America is paying attention and that there's going to be a sort of paradigm change uh, in terms of cultural norms? Well, people are certainly voting with their feet right now. <laughs> I mean, when you see the numbers of people, it's astonishing how many people are have already quit or are looking for new jobs. And what the research shows is it was something like 82% of people said that they would be willing to leave their employer if they found a more empathetic employer. And more than 60% said they'd take pay cut for that. Mm -hmm. So what we are seeing, and I think particularly with um, the millennials, is the sense that it's not only about the money. The money is not enough. I need to have um, an organization where I feel seen, accepted, understood, and supported for who I am as a person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. So you have developed what you call the LASER method, L-A-S-E-R as the acronym. And, you know, I have to say, I'm going to hold up this book again and, and just encourage people who are watching or those who are listening, The Empathetic Workplace, Catherine Manning, um, to read it because my sense of the book is that it is highly, highly practical, pragmatic, useful, like you learn tools that can be immediately applied, but not just in the workplace. I think there are wide applications in family, friends, neighbors, community across the board. And you have managed to weave into the practical tools so many personal stories that are really like very compelling to read and very memorable. So I just, I really want to acknowledge how much I enjoyed reading this book. So can you walk us through each of those three steps, please? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and thank you so much. That's really kind. Um, it was definitely a goal when I was writing this book. I, um, you know, my own background, I've worked with crime victims since college. I started um, really working on a hotline for domestic violence when I was 19 years old. And um, over the years working on, you know, cases like some of the ones you mentioned and a lot more that are not in the headlines, but are really, really um horrific and, and have stayed with me. Um, I know that it's not always easy to um, stay present and focused and supportive when you're talking to somebody who is having a really difficult time, um, sometimes for reasons that are, are um, just in the nature of being human. We are hardwired for empathy, which is phenomenal, but it also means that feelings are contagious. So if I'm talking to somebody who is incredibly angry, incredibly sad, I catch a little bit of those feelings as well. And it can make it hard for me to focus and um, respond appropriately to the person that I'm talking to. And so that's really why I knew that it would be helpful to come up with 
of roadmap, five steps, and also an acronym to help people follow in that moment when you're interacting with somebody who might be having an incredibly difficult time. So the five steps are number one, listen. Number two, acknowledge. Number three, share. Four, empower. And five, return. And yeah. in the book, I go through those in a lot more detail, obviously. Um, when it comes to listening, I always say that active listening is more than allowing the person to speak. It's creating the circumstances where they feel comfortable speaking. Mm-hmm. So we have to show them that we want to hear by nodding like you're doing, right? Nodding, eye contact, keeping an easy, open, neutral body posture, asking questions, asking just quick, open-ended questions. What happened next? Um, Where did you go? Those types of things invite people to continue talking, show them that we want to hear from them. And and as you, um, you know, you've just... uh... Um, done a little bit of a deep dive on the listening, which you say even in the book is like probably of the five, the most important. Um, although I think the return is, is very important too. And I, I look forward to talking about that in a sec. I wanted to read something from page 55 uh, that really, that was, that was a chapter that really caught my attention where you're, where you write about controlling your responses <clears throat> as you're listening. So you write, We've discussed empathy and the way we experience the emotions of individuals telling us a story. Sometimes though, it isn't just that you are experiencing some of their pain. Sometimes what they're telling you is infuriating. They're wrong. This isn't what happened. You feel a wave of righteous indignation, a tidal wave of it, and it's surging through you and it must come out to correct this horrific miscarriage of justice that is assailing you. My friend put a lid on that tidal wave. I know it's hard. How can they say these terrible things? Don't they know that it tr- isn't true? They must be misinterpreting the situation. I'll just correct them and then they'll feel better. They won't though. In fact, they'll feel worse and bizarrely so will you. Can we talk a little bit about that? Yeah, it's really hard. Um, when people are agitated, um, Sometimes it's hard for them to think clearly. This, it's part of the way trauma affects the brain is you can, you have trouble thinking clearly and sometimes you end up misunderstanding situations. You know, you, you're misreading what's happening. You are wrong on the facts. Um, but if you are in an elevated state, you're, you're still very agitated. It's nearly impossible for you to hear from anybody else. So if somebody comes to me and says, I am so furious at you because you told David that I wasn't going to go to this meeting and I was going to go to the meeting and you, you were um, completely wrong. And um, now David thinks that I'm irresponsible and it's all your fault. And they're, you know, yelling at me, yelling at me. If I just say, I never said that to David. (laughs) I know I didn't say that to David. Um, If that person is still so elevated that they can't hear me, it's like they will just run right over what I've said. Um, So what I have to do is just take a step back. Okay, this person is very, very angry right now. Um, I have to calm them down before they can hear me. And the way to do that is, and it's hard to do, you have to acknowledge what they're telling you. So, I, you know, I'm so furious that you didn't, you told David I wasn't going to that meeting and you've told, you know, he now thinks I'm irresponsible. Um, I can't say, I can't agree, right, that I told David that she wasn't going to the meeting. But what I can say is, oh my gosh, yeah, I'd be angry too. Um, yeah, like, of course you're not irresponsible. And then, you know, I'm, it's, it's like a ninja move, right? Like, I'm not, I'm not fighting fire with fire. I'm just stepping aside. And then they start to calm down a little bit. And then once they're able to breathe, like, you'll see the change in breathing. They start to calm down, take deeper breaths. Sometimes you'll even notice, like, their body posture, like their shoulders drop. Um, it's like the air is being let out. And then you can say, listen, I just have to let you know, I never said that to David. I don't know where he heard that. Maybe he misunderstood something I said, but trust me, I always knew you were going and I never told him that. 
Um, but you have to get past that moment. And the way to do it is you have to acknowledge what they're sharing with you. So I find this such a powerful concept, not just for people who are upset and maybe in a state of, of, of frustration, anger, trauma, but you know, in political arguments, in family strife, like the applications are really quite broad. And so do you have personal experience where when you figured this out and you started to use it all of a sudden, it was like, oh my gosh. I know I do it all the time, all the time with my kids to the point where they now say, mom, you're just acknowledging me. (laughs) (laughs) I've got three teenagers at home. So there's a lot of emotion Um, and that's good and normal. And that's exactly as it should be. Um, What I need to do is not, you know, be adding fuel to that fire is just recognize, wow, you are super angry right now. I totally understand that. I can see how angry you are. Well, my daughter's five, so I imagine that's going to come in handy, like, you know, as she grows. But where I saw it happen in my current life is I teach, right? I was teaching two two courses this semester, and I was reading that chapter as some new things were happening in my classroom. You know, I've, I've been teaching for more than 10 years, and uh, there was a, a, um, a tenor or a tone that's different than it was two years ago pre-pandemic. And I think that there's a lot of things that have happened in society that has exacerbated people not willing to kind of put up with BS. But there was also some triggering moments where there was a degree of militancy and a particular opinion that almost, you know, meant that other people who had a different opinion wouldn't speak. And I found myself very unsure how to navigate that. And so that was helpful because acknowledging where someone is at, but not necessarily agreeing with them is different and can open up space for them to continue listening to an alternative perspective. And I think we really need to flex that muscle. So thank you for for bringing that to our attention. That was like a really great chapter. Um, Oh, yeah, gosh, absolutely. Thank you for pointing that out. And yeah, I've I've got to agree, you know, I teach as well. And I agree that there is something different. I think it's been really hard on so many students from very young all the way up through grad school. This time of the pandemic has been really, really hard. Um, So absolutely, everything we can do to bring empathy into the classroom, I think is really, really important right now. Today's episode was brought to you by Grant Here and International, an on-demand coaching provider for individuals and companies. Now, I, I said that I wanted to return to return because I also find those really, really important. So I'll let you uh, cover because there's two aspects to return. So what are they about? Yeah, absolutely. So return means both literally returning to the person in trauma, just checking in later, send an email or a text, how you doing, was thinking about you, um, would love to hear how your mom is, whatever it is. Um, And for that, I advise calendaring it. Um, sometimes we'll have this very intense personal conversation and we'll think, of course, like, of course, I'm going to remember this and, and I'll remember to check in, but we all get swept up in our lives and it's really, really easy to lose track of things. So I will just put a little note in my calendar, check in with so-and-so in two weeks, and I'll send a quick text or an email or something just to let them know that I'm still around and can continue to be a support for them and that I wasn't just kind of saying what I needed to, to get them off the phone. I actually care about them. Um, So that's one piece of it. And then the other is a return to ourselves because the reality is that supporting others through times of stress and trauma takes a toll on us. Um, So I talked earlier about the contagion effect of feelings that we catch a little bit of the feelings of the people we're interacting with. When the person that we're interacting with is going through a trauma and having a trauma response, the effect on us, that contagion effect is called secondary trauma. And it can have an effect on our physical and mental health, um, sleeplessness, all, all kinds of difficulties that can come out of that. It also can lead over time to what's called compassion fatigue. And that's, more similar to burnout. It's this sense of over time, um, I have started to be worn down by my efforts to support the people around me. Um, Compassion fatigue is tricky because 
it is often very slow to develop. Um, and so one of the stories I tell in the book is about one of my former colleagues at DOJ, who was a prosecutor of child exploitation cases. And he's a phenomenal lawyer, very, very smart man who also is incredibly compassionate and great with victims. And he and I worked together on a project for a year or two and I really liked him. You know, he was very easy to work with and kind and, and um, we just had a great working relationship. And then the project ended and a few years passed. And then we had another project that brought us together again. And this time he was like a different person. He was suddenly really sarcastic and bitter and um, quick to anger. I mean, never directed at me at all. He was always incredibly polite and kind with me and professional, but just the little kind of bumps that you hit on any project would just kind of, he would go flying off the handle. And I thought, what on earth happened to him? And finally, I realized it was compassion fatigue, that it was the toll of all these years of working on child exploitation cases. And he did eventually end up transferring out of the unit. I think the only reason that I recognized it in him is because we had had that period where I wasn't working with him regularly. I think if I were seeing him every day, I probably would not have spotted it Um, because it is so gradual. It's every day a little bit more. So we have to be really careful about it. Um, So what I like to say is the, the best defense is a good offense. You have to affirmatively try to protect yourself from compassion fatigue. So just a few things that I like to do on that. And please know that I am speaking as somebody who has struggled with this over the years. This is, this is hard won wisdom. Um, so the things that I say are, um, one, try to make it a daily routine, some kind of daily reset, um, which could be exercise or meditation or prayer or art. A lot of people are, uh, use art as an outlet and that's phenomenal. Um, The second thing is get more comfortable talking about our own challenges. Um, A lot of us are so good at supporting others and not as good about talking about the things that we're carrying. And obviously we have to protect confidentiality, but we can talk about our own feelings. You know, I had a really hard conversation today. I'm not sure I said the right thing. I don't think I was helpful at all. None of that is breaching confidentiality. Um, And obviously we can always journal, that kind of thing. So one is self-care, two is talk about it. And then three is know your warning signs. Um, What are the things that are a sign that you're starting to suffer from compassion fatigue or burnout? Um, Sometimes it's that shorter temper. For me, honestly, Anita, sometimes it's that I start swearing more. I'm not somebody who swears a lot. So if suddenly I sound like a sailor, I'm like, huh, (laughs) something's going on there. Um, another one that's common is apathy, where people just think, I don't care at all. I, I, you know, they can read about horrible things in the news and they just can't muster any sense of sympathy at all. Um, another one is where things that normally would be fun start to feel like a burden. So just start to recognize what are the things that are hard for you, you know, a sign that you are struggling right now. And I think that that's an important message because we've all been living like this chronic state of anxiety, uncertainty, stress, change, and we're all feeling, I think, a bit burnt out and a bit, um, uh, we're feeling compassion fatigue because we've been taking care of kids and taking care of our elders and worry about them. So I think it's, it's no surprise if if we're all a little bit more on edge and, you know, not living up to our best behavior and really this self-care is crucial if we're going to collectively kind of come out of this um, together. Yeah. What are some of the ways that leaders uh, can practice empathy and, uh, and bring that into their organization? Absolutely. I'm so glad you asked that. Well, um, One thing is having that empathetic response when somebody does come forward with a challenge of some kind, Um, because you can bet if one person has come forward with an issue, everybody else is watching to see what your reaction is. And if you respond in a supportive way, other people are going to feel safe for coming to you as well. So just that incorporating laser into your own 
ways of being will make a big difference. Um, other things that I think are really important in terms of creating an empathetic workplace are making sure that you have policies and procedures in place that are employee friendly. There are a lot of really incredible creative ways that organizations are showing their employees that they care about them. I mean, I'm just always amazed. Things that had never occurred to me before, like um, organizations have started to provide miscarriage leave, um, Mm -hmm. which is something that a lot of people experience. And um, usually it's something that is very private and they deal with on their own. And to know that your workplace stands beside you in that moment can really mean a lot. Um, Organizations are also implementing not just mental health support, but racially and culturally sensitive mental health supports, which again, um, can truly make all the difference in the world and people feeling supported and um, welcome and included, um, valued in this organization. So policies and procedures in place, the next thing is you have to talk about them. Um, It's great to have that miscarriage policy on the books, but if people don't know about it, it's not doing you all that much good. So make sure that people um, know about the, all the great benefits that you offer offer um, because you don't always know who needs them. So talk about them widely and repeatedly. And then finally, and I think this one is maybe even the most important, um, it, is a, it is one thing, it's, it's great. If you can say, we have a phenomenal EAP program and I highly recommend them. They're free and they're confidential. It is very different if you say, we have a phenomenal EAP program. I've used them myself. They were fantastic and really helpful to me. Mm-hmm. If you can model that it is okay to seek those supports um, and that you yourself sometimes need help and that the organization supports you through it, that is truly, a, a it, it just speaks so much louder than just your words directing other people to those supports. We have to, as leaders, be willing to make ourselves vulnerable by opening up about our own struggles. Yeah. And I think that circles back to that original idea of, you know, things need to shift kind of the paradigm needs to shift where we give ourselves permission to be whole person, vulnerable in our workplace that gives permission to others. And it elevates us all to kind of, you know, that social capital, that trust, the communication, all that good stuff um, emerges to add to what you were saying. You know, it makes me think of this work, um, I think it's fantastic that these companies that you're talking about, these organizations are implementing these empathic policies. But one of the things that I think um, is also an opportunity is that they don't have to like come up with the ideas all by themselves, right? I think so much of it is just from listening to what the organization and what the, you know, the talent and the members of your, your, your staff say would be helpful to them. I mean, I remember doing some work for a, a, a med school and, you know, there were 25 administrators and leaders who all through like a design session came to the realization that they don't actually have a place to hang out and chill out like a staff lounge. And the rector of the school, like she heard it so clearly that this was missing, that in the weekend between the two sessions went out and, you know, emptied a storeroom and a box, you know, a bunch of boxes painted the place had beautiful sofas and and uh, cushions and 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 a big screen tv and and games and all sorts of stuff like it was a beautiful room and we did the big reveal i was actually present for the big reveal and there were people like giddy laughter and people wiping away tears and it was like a goosebump moment and i really think that we don't have to figure this out all by ourselves i think we just need to ask the question how can we be helpful? How can we show more empathy to you right now? You know, I love it. Ah, and what a powerful moment of I hear you. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. I was touched by the conclusion of your book. Um, I'd never seen this Maya Angelou quote before. I'm going to read it and then ask sort of, you know, the, the, what, there's a special kind of I won't use taste in my mouth, but there's a special tone to the ending of your book. And I want to, I want to hear from your words, how, what you want to leave readers with. So Maya Angelou's quote is my wish for you is that you continue, continue to be who and how you are to astonish a mean world with your acts of kindness. Why did you use that quote? Um, I do love that quote. And what I love about it is the, um, 
the warmth and generosity of it that and that is really the way I feel for the audience and, and for everybody who is trying their hardest to show up well for the people around them. I know that it's hard to do. Um, trust me, I've messed up many times. There are so many times where I've thought, gosh, I wish I had done this better. Um, and there are times when I myself have gotten really worn down by some of the horrible things happening in this mean world, right? Mm-hmm. Um, But at the same time, again and again, I'm astonished by the kindness, the sincerity, the authenticity of people showing up for each other, putting things, their own interests aside and dropping everything to show up for somebody, sometimes not a friend or a coworker, sometimes a stranger. But when that human connection, that human, I see you, I can tell that you need me right now and I'm here to me that it just astonishes me it blows me away every time Mm -hmm. yeah so as a final question and it's been such a pleasure to have this conversation with you I love asking my guests at the end of the show if they can remember a time or want to share a time when they were on the receiving end of empathy empathy on purpose purposeful empathy and what that meant to you You know, um, I have a friend who it's like she it's like she can tell it's in the air. You know, (laughs) even if I haven't expressed to her that I'm having a hard time, um, she can just tell. And she does an incredible thing, which is she will send me the exact right card with the exact right message that says, keep going. I believe in you. I am so proud of you. And, you know, particularly over this last year, as I've launched a book and three teenagers at home and all of the, you know, it's been a stressful time. And knowing that there is this friend out there who is pulling for me, um, it really, it really has been such a, such a real drive for me. It's been really, really a gift. Wow. Well, shout out to the BFF whose name will be unnamed, but she knows who she is. Uh, Thank you so much for sharing the laser method. Uh, I'm so girl crushing on you. I'm sure my listeners and viewers are as well. Please pick up the empathic or I say the empathic, but it's the empathetic workplace. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time on Purposeful Empathy. What if you had access to your own council of coaches to help you break free from your thinking clutter, make that important decision, and liberate you from whatever's holding you back? At Grand Huron International, you get to choose the coach of your choice anytime from anywhere. Visit International.com and harness the power of on-demand coaching today.